Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Corey. I am a software engineer at Mirantis and a maintainer on the Mobi project, the upstream for the Docker engine. Today, I'll be sharing one technique we use to make uh, some Docker container operations faster and less resource intensive on Linux, and explain how you could use the same techniques in your own Go programs. I'd like to start with a motivating example, increasing the limit on how many container, ima container image layers can be mounted. Uh, Mobi typically uses the overlay file system to compose the layers of a container image. When uh, mounting an overlay FS, the source argument is ignored, and the source directory paths are passed in through the mount options. There is no hard limit on the number of layers in an OCI image, but how many layers can we mount at a time with OverlayFS? Well, uh, file system specific mount options are passed into the mount system called through that data argument. Note how there's no argument for uh, the size of it, of the data. How then does the kernel know how much data to copy into kernel space? While OverlayFS, in particular, expects data to be a null terminated string, the Linux ABI doesn't actually require that it be one. And besides, even if it did, the kernel can't just trust that user space is passing a valid string of a reasonably small length. So in actuality, the kernel copies one page of data, which in practice is four kilobytes. Taking into account the null terminator, we have 4,095 bytes of options which, you know, for a traditional file system where you've got like options like no exec, that's fine, but that's pretty restrictive for overlay FS. There is a new set of uh, file system creation context syscalls, uh, uh, new in Linux 5.2, which lifts this limitation. Unfortunately, we still have to support older kernels for now, so we're stuck with uh, the mount syscall and its limitations. One way to increase the number of layers we can squeeze into one mount option string is to reduce the redundancy. So the uh, directory paths in those mount options can be made relative to the process's current working directory. So we can change our working directory to the common prefix and uh, squeeze a few more layers in. Now, changing the working directory temporarily is like just fine in a single-threaded process, but Dockerd is multi-threaded. And the current working directory is global state shared by all threads, so changing it would affect every open call and every other thread until it's changed back. And if two threads tried to concurrently mount, uh, uh, mount container file systems, they would collide. Now, the Mobi project historically took the approach of starting itself as a child process, and then the child would change its working directory, mount, and exit. Now, starting a whole new Go press fr process from scratch dominates the time to issue the mount syscall, and uh, we have to deal with moving data and results across a process boundary. I mean, there's got to be a better way. Let's uh, first dig a bit deeper into how processes are started. Launching a new program as a subprocess is a multi-step procedure. First, you call fork, which duplicates the calling thread in a copy of its memory space. Now, forking is fairly cheap on Linux because memory is copy on write. Next, the child process sets up the execution context, such as changing the current working directory. And finally, the child will call execve to replace itself with the new program. Well, the child process doesn't have to exec. It could keep running the same, process, same program as the parent until it exits. So that's one possible solution. Fork a child process whose only job is uh, to change directory, mount, and exit. Unfortunately, Docker daemon's written in Go, and fork without exec is not supported in Go programs. You could invoke the raw syscall if you want, but the child process is going to be in a very sad state. The child will inherit uh, copies of all the mutexes in the parent, but will start with just one thread. None of the garbage collector threads will be running, and the child will likely deadlock rather quickly on one of those mutexes. Uh, Go programs are able to spawn new child processes, but the runtime makes all the arrangements to fork an exec on your behalf. It needs to do a lot of preparatory work to make it safe and reliable, uh, details which are deeply tied to those runtime internals. So unless you are the Go runtime, or are willing to tie yourself to the implementation details of a particular runtime, write code in an extremely limited dialect of Go 
and pray that toolchain updates won't break you. You cannot fork in Go programs without also execing. Now, while Go programs may not be able to cheaply fork off child processes, they do have an abundance of threads. Now, how come changing the current working directory in one thread affects the current working directory of all the other threads? Well, in a word, because POSIX says so. In a more practical sense, the current working directory is shared because the threading library, or in Go's case, the language runtime, has instructed the kernel to make it that way. Threads are spawned using the clone system call, which compared to fork gives the caller more precise control over what is and is not shared between the caller and the child. Clone can also be used to spawn processes as there's not much distinction between processes and threads. A thread's just a process that shares a thread group ID, virtual memory space, and signal handlers with other threads in the process. Other pieces of execution context can be shared, but don't actually have to be under Linux. Uh, so for instance, if the clone FS flag is passed to the clone syscall, the calling process and child process share the same file system information, which encompasses the file system root, the umask, and the current working directory. Otherwise, the child gets a copy. Now, most of the process execution context that can be shared using clone can be unshared using the appropriately named unshare syscall. A uh, thread can call unshare with the clonefs flag to then reverse the effects of clone, uh, disassociating its file system information from that of the other threads. Now, note that there is uh, no way to reassociate the thread's file system information afterwards. Uh, you may be wondering how unshare can be used in, in Go programs as threads aren't exposed to application code. All application code runs in Go routines which do not map one-to-one -one onto threads. The runtime uh, schedules Go routines onto a pool of threads, uh, not entirely unlike how the kernel schedules threads onto CPU cores. If a Go routine blocks waiting on some I.O., uh, receiving on a channel, acquiring a mutex, uh, or simply if the runtime decides to preempt that Go routine because it's been running for too long, uh, the runtime may go and schedule some other Go routine onto that same thread. Different Go routines may run on the same thread at different times, and any particular Go routine may run on different threads throughout its lifetime. Uh, normally, it does not matter that a Go routine may suddenly find itself running on a different thread, as aside from having different thread IDs, all the threads are practically identical. Well, unsharing parts of a thread's execution context makes the thread different from the others. It would cause chaos if uh, random Go routines were to be scheduled onto such an unshared thread. Uh, for example, the Go routine that wanted to change just its own working directory could unexpectedly find its working directory reverted. And then some other Go routine would see the changed working directory, all at the whims of the runtime. Thankfully, Go has a solution for this. Runtime.lockOS thread wires the calling Go routine to its current thread until an equal number of calls are made to unlock OS thread. The uh, call and go routine will always execute in that thread exclusively. Since unsharing a thread's file system information is irreversible, no other go routine uh, can ever be allowed to be scheduled to run on that unshared thread. Thankfully, Go also has a solution for this. You simply return from the go routine function without unlocking it from the thread, and the runtime will terminate the thread and eventually spawn a new one to replace it. This is roughly what uh, changing the working directory to mount looks like, uh, minus any error handling. You spawn a new Go routine for this operation, uh, lock it to a thread, unshare the file system information, then we can simply go change the working directory, mount, and return. The ability to wire Go routines to threads makes it possible to do things in Go programs which could not be done in any other way. I'll take you through a few other examples of how it's used within Mobi. Uh, path sanitization. It's really hard to get right from user space. Uh, the kernel can do a much better job, especially because it can do it atomically. Uh, the openat2 syscall makes it easy to guard against path reversal attacks, though that's only available from Linux 5.6. Uh, in order to support older kernels, Mobi takes a different approach. Sandboxing the thread so it cannot open paths outside of where it's allowed to. For use cases like ours, such as untarring image layers, where we don't need to sandbox arbitrary untrusted code, chroot is arguably perfectly adequate. Uh, 
when used from memory safe language. Uh, the root directory is part of the thread file system information, so on sharing it makes ch root calls thread local in addition to chdir. Unfortunately, using chroot makes Mobi incompatible with GR security kernels because those kernels block chmod and make node in chrooted threads. We work around this by instead using pivot root to change the root mount of the current mount namespace, which is a much more robust uh, sandboxing mechanism as well. But we can't safely modify the existing mount namespace as it could be shared by many other processes, not to mention the other threads. So we call unshare with a clone new ns flag which moves the thread into a new mount namespace, which is initialized to a copy of the previous. Now we're free to mount, unmount, and pivot mounts to our heart's content without affecting the mount table of any other thread or any other process. Uh, another use for wiring go routines to threads is to enter a container's network namespace. The only information you need to know to access the network namespace created for a container is the container's process ID. Moby enters uh, the container network namespaces to provide a DNS resolver over uh, the container loopback interface, which can resolve the private addresses of other containers, and to forward DNS queries from one container to a DNS server running in another container. The uh, setNS system call is uh, used to move the calling thread to the namespace referenced by a file descriptor. Unlike a more traditional process state, such as the file system information I spoke about earlier, uh, the thread can be moved back to its starting namespace with another call to set NS. And a thread which has had its namespaces restored is indistinguishable from threads, threads which were never moved at all, and so can be reused by the Go runtime for other Go routines. Uh, a combination of unshare and set NS can also be used to cheaply create a new network namespace, for example, as I'm demonstrating here. Uh, manipulating the execution context of threads in a language which hide threads from the application is not always going to be easy. There are sharp edges and gotchas which you need to be aware of if you want to apply these techniques to your own Go programs. You may find unexpected and uh, even impossible behaviors in completely unrelated parts of your application if you get things wrong. The Go runtime and most Go code assumes, quite reasonably, that all execution contexts are made equal, that they all have the same file descriptor table, view of the file system, UID, GID, network interfaces, et cetera. If you violate the invariant that uh, all unlocked OS threads are fungible, you're gonna have a bad time. Make sure to always lock your Go routine to a thread before manipulating its thread's execution context, and only unlock after you've put the thread back exactly the way you found it, which may not always be possible. So when in doubt, keep the Go routine locked to the thread and let the runtime terminate it. When uh, writing code which opens handles to the thread's original namespaces, make sure to lock the Go routine before opening handles to its original namespaces and open from that Go routine. Otherwise, your code might restore the thread to the wrong namespace. I've done this and it was not a fun bug to chase down. Uh, the initial thread of a process is known as the, uh, as the thread group leader. Go routines can be scheduled onto it, same as any other thread. This is important to keep in mind when modifying the execution context of your program's threads because the proc self magic link refers to the thread group leader, not the current thread. This can trip you up in a couple of ways. Unless your Go routine happens to be locked to the thread group leader, the files in proc self are not going to reflect the unshared state of the thread your Go routine is ex executing on. When writing code which opens proc files for an unshared thread, make sure to open the files for, the, for that particular thread. Use the proc self task directory for the current thread ID, or the proc thread self magic link on Linux 3.17 and above. Remember to lock the go routine to the thread first so the thread doesn't change underneath you. And to avo avoid any surprises with code and with external processes which aren't prepared for your unshared shenanigans, I recommend that you lock the main Go routine to the thread group leader. Go guarantees that init functions will run on the thread group leader, and also that main will also be executed on the leader if lock OS thread has been called from an init, init function. So long as the thread leader thread is left alone, any code in your process running on unlock Go routines can continue to open files through proc self and get the expected results, as the threads they're running on will be sharing all the execution context with the leader. And the last gotcha I want to talk about is the parent death signal option. When starting a subprocess, you can instruct the kernel to send it a signal if the parent dies. 
It's very handy for ensuring you don't leak subprocess if your process crashes, for example. However, the, current, the kernel considers the parent to be the thread which started the subprocess. If some routine, go routine which locks and exits gets scheduled onto the same thread which you had previously used to start a subprocess, your subprocess will get signaled seemingly at random. You can guard against this by locking the go routine you will be starting the subprocess from to its thread and not unlocking it until after the subprocess exits. Thank you.